So I'm here to talk about Fedora 21, uh, which is awesome. Um, I guess and some notes about me just for clarification. I used to work for Daddy Shadow Man at Red Hat until like two months ago. During my uh, many years at Red Hat, I was a Fedora project leader. Uh, and then I left. So now I work, as Hans mentioned, at Elasticsearch. I'm a, my title is developer advocate. I'm actually talking to my boss about changing my title to operations advocate or operator advocate because I've never been a developer. And if you're a developer, I still love you and appreciate you, I'm sure, from the bottom of my heart. But so the developer advocate thing is like a title that everybody sort of has, and it's sort of replacing the community manager uh, moniker. But, uh, you know, it, I find it to be kind of odd because it's like, I'm not really a developer advocate or an operations advocate. Mostly I'm paid to be an Elasticsearch advocate. So before I talk about Fedora 21, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Fedora so that you have some idea of what I talk about after that, where that's going. So Fedora's been around for a while, I guess probably 10 and a half years now, um, since the dawn of time. Fedora has been released about every six months. Sometimes it's been like nine months. This last release was like 11 months, which was sort of scary. But hey, I wasn't in charge at the end, so ha um, But in general, it's always been dedicated to bringing the newest features, the most bleeding edge stuff, you know, sometimes to the point of almost too bleeding edge, but uh, bringing the newest innovations to the Linux, you know, distro world first. Um, being every six months, you know, for a lot of people is too fast. I mean, every, you know, it, it's got 13 months till its end of life, but, you know, you're sort of pushed to, you know, every six months you need to upgrade, you want to upgrade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which, you know, back in the day for people who were into Linux when Linux was like the crazy thing to do, um, <laughs> That was okay, but now that it's a little bit more mainstream and lots of people use it, like people don't really want to upgrade every six months. People are okay with every two years. Um, but the six-month cycle for those of us who do use Fedora really helps the community to sort of uh, filter out bad ideas or you know figure out figure out what's good and what's bad. Um, generally, there's not a lot of bad ideas. Most of those get caught and you know, struck down by you know, various parts of the project before that happens. But you know, the worst case scenario is, if we ever did something really, really, really terrible, we'd only have to live with that mistake for six months, possibly even less if, you know, if it can just be patched up and you know, forgotten about. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, a lot of people do not know that Fedora is the upstream for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So hence why Red Hat sponsors it. Um, but every four to five releases of Fedora, uh, it is branched off and it is the thing that becomes Red Hat Enterprise Linux and then subsequently becomes CentOS and Scientific Linux and you know all of the other various uh, RHEL der derivatives that are out there. Um, so yeah, it's uh, despite being sponsored by Red Hat, it is pretty much fully produced by a actual real honest to god community of people who are not just you know sort of shilling for red hat um you know the people who manage all of the engineering uh decisions all the people who manage the uh governance decisions people who manage you know all the various policies and governance and all the little bits and details is you know not red hat employees it's you know sometimes red hat employees sometimes not red hat employees which is why people like me who don't work at red hat anymore can still come and talk all they want about Fedora, which is awesome. Um, anyway, Fedora, since the dawn of time, as I mentioned, has always been one product, right? There's just one Fedora. Uh, we do have spins, so if there's a different, if you want to run a different desktop than the default desktop, which is GNOME, <coughs> so let's say for a minute, for some crazy reason, <laughs> you want to run KDE because you don't like GNOME 3. I don't know if this has ever happened to anyone at all. Um, <coughs> We have spins available so that you can go ahead and do that, but it's always been built on sort of the same base on which people would run a desktop and a server or cloud stuff, etc. Um, and that has served us well for, you know, 10 years, 20 releases. Uh, so now we're getting to adulthood, right? Fedora can now start drinking. Uh, so we're at Fedora 21. And 
the digital landscape has sort of changed over the years, right? Um, there used to just be Linux, and you would run it on a server, or maybe your you know, home machine, or maybe your desktop. And now we've got like the cloud, and the Internet of Things, and you know, Docker is like the hottest word ever for at least another month or so, and I'm sure something else will come along and be even cooler and hotter than that. But lots and lots of things have you know, changed. It's you know, uh, constantly moving. Um, open source is not just Linux anymore. Uh, one of my friends actually did a graph of sort of the activity of people doing packaging in Fedora and how it related to the number of packages uh, or number of uh, projects that were in GitHub. And it was sort of like Fedora is going down like this while GitHub is, you know, growing exponentially. Um, and a lot of folks don't even really care about, you know, getting their stuff packaged in a distro anymore. It's sort of a moot point. Um, I think also just the general way society is sort of, <laughs> we all have phones now. We can check our email constantly. We can, you know, uh, there's an app for that. There's an app for everything. Um, people, you know, want something that is actually suited to their needs, right? And I think the general feeling in Fedora, you know, above and beyond everything else, beyond the, you know, typical distro, uh, you know, tug of wars and, you know, who's in charge and what decisions should we make? Um, I think people sort of started to feel like, you know, we've gotten this far, you know, maybe we should sort of re-examine our core values and figure out, you know, is this something that's going to, s the way we've been doing things, is that going to serve us for the next 20 years or 20 releases in 10 years or, you know, should we think about doing stuff differently? And that's actually, you know, what we decided. So we decided to change things. So this is not actually what it looks like. Um, when you decide to change everything about a distro. I love Beaker, don't you guys? Yeah, so for forever, we've always had, you know, the one fedora, or as I always joke, the one thing to rule them all. And we actually decided that we would separate it up into three separate products. I mean, how amazing is this, right? So we've got a cloud version and a server version and a workstation version. So you can actually get a version of Fedora that is what you want it actually for and not necessarily like the hybrid of decision making between eh, it's a server and a workstation and why do I have cups running in EC2 because you know you don't really print in the cloud things like that um, got rid of that stuff um, yeah so why you know aside from the no longer one thing to rule them all uh, I think being a decent voice for server was one of the big drivers. Um, Fedora had always, well, for a long time, had a audience target that was basically, we want everybody in the world to start using Linux, and the best way to reach those people was by the desktop. And, you know, people joke about the year of the Linux desktop. That, that ship is you know, <laughs> sailed right, right on by. I don't think it's ever going to be the year of the Linux desktop. The idea behind the workstation was basically to have something for developers, to not have something that, you know, we wanted to, I don't want to say dumb down, but, you know, we want, always had to strive to make it super easy for, like, the newbiest of noobs to get on and use Linux. And, you know, eventually we came to the conclusion that, you know, we're very bleeding edge, sometimes way too bleeding edge for new users, and maybe we ought to just focus on the people who have been sort of our core audience, which is mostly developers, whether it's systems developers or application developers, et cetera. Um, since it's also the upstream for RHEL, uh, you know, having to balance this whole uh, desktop user stuff with, well, our corporate sponsor, you know, would really like it if we didn't turn their product that makes, you know, a billion dollars a year into a desktop, you know, they're not telling us exactly what to do, but they're also, you know, not necessarily inclined to continue to sponsor us if we're not doing, you know, <laughs> if we're not serving their needs in some way. So one of the things that we did in order to make this actually possible was, you know, before it was just sort of like, there's a kernel and there's a bunch of packages sort of around it. And all the packages around it all had the same exact policies. So whether you wanted to package one little thing for yourself that, you know, no one else on earth was ever going to use, or you wanted to package like OpenOffice, right? 
same exact policies, you know, whether it's a leaf package or, you know, a core package. Um, and when we bundled that up and shipped it to someone, it was everything. There was no separation of like, well, this is really only useful for cloud or this is only useful for server. And, you know, people who run a desktop really don't need open stack on their desktop. I, in order to actually break this out into three products uh, in a way that would actually be functional, um, we came up with this idea of, you know, sort of having a, a core that's just the, the just, just enough operating system uh, with a modular kernel so that we can, you know, pull things out that don't actually need to be in there for certain types of applications. Um, environments and stacks is, you know, depending on what you're doing, you know, you may want a certain version of uh, like Java or a certain version of Python and we've designed it so that, you know, if you wanted to, you know, take Fedora and as a base for rolling your own distribution, you should be able to swap that stuff out fairly easily. And then, Finally, the applications, the ones that aren't, you know, core to the operating system stuff, again, like, like open office, um, things like that are a little bit easier, well, I wouldn't say a little bit easier, a lot easier now to package because they're, they're not so interwoven with so many dependencies and, you know, people battling to figure out, like, well, this has to be based on, you know, this version of Python, and so does this, but they're not, and so who's going to win, and, you know, battle, and drama, and... So, Fedora 21 Cloud. Uh, for a while, a long time, probably since Fedora 13 or Fedora 14, uh, Fedora Cloud is sort of a, a second class product, sort of the afterthought. Um, and this is really the first release where, you know, we've actually gotten our stuff together and cloud is actually a real thing now, uh, just in time for the cloud world to take off a couple years ago. Um, anyways, in Fedora, this takes on a lot of forms. Uh, so number one is Docker, 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 Docker. Uh, anyway, there's a, we actually have official Fedora Docker images in Docker land now. Uh, Project Atomic is the, I guess, Fedora slash rel version of the thing that is called CoreOS. Who here is familiar with CoreOS? Yeah, so CoreOS is basically a very minimal operating system that is basically designed for launching Docker containers. And this is basically our version of that. Uh, it's very much based on the lovely thing that we call System D. Um, one of the cool things about it is that the operating system basically, uh, you can roll it back like atomically all at once. Basically, think of it as like a snapshot. Like, you know, you move it forward, you don't like that, you can just snap it right back to where it was rather than, you know, yum up undoing and whatever you do. and. Ubuntu land and Debian land to uh, undo the big giant mistake you just made. Um, anyway, and actually like officially produced and rather than hand cobbled together, these are actually like release engineering produced uh, images for, you know, whether you're running OpenStack, Jill's favorite thing, or CloudStack, uh, or Eucalyptus. Uh, I think that basically covers all the things that people might buy these days, or I'm sorry, install these days, uh, if they are going to run their own infrastructure as a service. Service. Um, plus we have Omnis for AWS, which is one thing that we've actually had for a while. Um, anyway, Fedora 21 Cloud is actually like a thing, and I'm very happy because when I started in Fedora like four years ago, that was the thing that I actually started paying attention to. I was like, dude, this is really sad. We have no cloud stuff. So it's been nice for me to see it sort of grow up after years and years of IRC meetings and insisting to like the CEO of Red Hat that cloud was important. Maybe we should pay attention. Uh, Fedora 21 server, which is a thing that, you know, I suspect most people sort of at least care about from the, one of the things that we've always told people is that if you want to know what's coming down the road, like in RHEL 7, for example, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, RHEL 7's out, and my boss is telling me that I have to do it, and oh my god, System D, and like all these other things that they have never seen before, but, you know, if you actually pay attention to Fedora, like you learned about System D and all the other, you know, new little things going on in, in Fedora 21 quite a while ago, so um, I encourage you, if you have to use RHEL or CentOS at work, you know, to peek in on what Fedora is doing every once in a while because it's a pretty good indicator of where things are going, and also if 
you're a sysadmin and you think something is a really bad idea, then those are the voices that we count on because sometimes developers of operating systems um, have never been system administrators. I'm talking to all of you out there in the camera. Um, they've never been sysadmins and therefore sort of lack the uh, empathy needed of you know, what it's like to get woken up by a pager at 3 in the morning. Not that I'm still recovering from ever doing that in my life. <sighs> okay, anyway, uh, lots of new server management features. Um, Cockpit is on here, and that's something that is largely used to actually manage some of the Fedora atomic stuff. Um, but there's a bunch of new uh, little tools in here. Uh, Rollkit is uh, something that we're, I, I think of it almost as borderline like configuration management, but basically, you know, you can go in to a menu and basically say like, oh, I want like a LAMP stack, and it'll install a LAMP stack. Um, and actually, you know, the one of the things that uh, was in Fedora 21, one of the first ones that we've done because it's really, really new. Like Fedora 21 was like the, I don't want to call it beta, but you know, the very first time that this has been included in Fedora at all. Um, so it's still pretty much in the trying it out, seeing what people think phase of things. But uh, deploying free IPA, which is like a authentication identity piece of software for those of you who are into that kind of thing. Uh, if you want to manage uh, users and groups and roles and all that kind of stuff on a bunch of computers, um, it's a cool thing to do. So anyway, uh, if anybody is into open LMI, uh, monitoring your system events, etc., cetera, um, that's come a long way. That's in Fedora 21. The third uh, Fedora product is a workstation. I talked a bit about it earlier, and the idea behind that was to actually make a real developer workstation. Um, there's lots of new stuff in there, um, aside from, you know, we, we track GNOME as closely as possible. So it's got GNOME 3.14, which has some new whatever. It's GNOME. They do a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm actually probably going to go back to KDE because I really like them. Um, Dev Assistant, um, which is sort of like a, almost like a, if you're getting started with being a developer, or maybe you're a developer and you're getting started with a new language, um, you know, you can use this tool to basically uh, kickstart a project, you know, like, I need to write something in Ruby, I've never done it, and it will, you know, go ahead and, you know, get your libraries and, you know, figure out if you, you know, I guess, open up a terminal window for you and tell you that, you know, you're crazy, don't do stuff in Ruby. No, I'm totally kidding. Love you, Ruby guys. Love you so much. Um, lots of other love. Uh, Fedora tends to be sort of bleeding edge when it comes to, you know, languages. Uh, so, like, Java 8's the default now, like, which isn't really the case in a lot of other places. Uh, there's a fabulous GCC book up here that I think Hans is giving away at some point. Uh, so we've moved to GCC 4.9. Uh, you know, the new versions of Python, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, etc. Um, if you're into Hadoop, Hadoopy things, big data, uh, you can basically run all of the newest versions of the Hadoop ecosystem tools. And like, you know, I have Ambari and HBase and all these other things. Like, that's the new stuff that's been added into Fedora on top of the existing Hadoop stuff that is already there. Um, there's a large big data sig. They're working very hard on making all this stuff work, working with the Apache Software Foundation to make sure that, uh, you know, all this stuff is tied in with all the continuous integration and that it works well with Fedora. And it's very cool uh, watching them do all the stuff they're doing. Um, anyway, if you like to play with any of that stuff, uh, it really is finely tuned, works really well in Fedora right now. Um, I mentioned earlier Docker container images. Um, Jenkins, didn't know why that wasn't in Fedora before anyways, but glad to see it there. Uh, MariaDB, newest version. Uh, KDE, I mentioned this earlier. Um, anyway, newest version of KDE, it's like a big bump, sort of like when it went from, I can't remember if it was KDE 3 or KDE 4 where people were just like on fire the way they were when we went to GNOME 3. Uh, or maybe it's just every time every desktop group does a new major version and changes everything. But people are pretty happy with this. So 
Um, system D, we talked about this earlier. Uh, one of the uh, things with System D that some people were sad about was that uh, the journal basically sort of prevented you from, it didn't prevent you, but it, it basically was designed for desktop or workstation logging and not really for server logging. So uh, now, for example, if you were a system administrator and you, I don't know, took care of more than one machine, as most system administrators probably do, um, you don't have to, you know, personally look at every single server. You can ship those uh, logs off to somewhere else using, I don't know, you can analyze them maybe with things that my current company does, but I'm not going to totally pitch the lovely things that, that Elasticsearch is working on. We'll save that for next month. Um, we also do lots of uh, different architectures, so ARM, 64, System Z, all that stuff is out now. There is more stuff in Fedora than I can possibly talk about, like in a four hour presentation, let alone whatever, however long I've been rambling on here. Uh, if you'd like to try it out, lots of different ways to try it out, I suggest you go to getfedora.org and check out the lovely new website that they have built also, because it's awesome. Um, but the main website, fedoraproject.org, has lots of stuff, not just about the products that we make, but also about the community, ways you can join the community, ways you can participate in the community. Uh, you can go from being a stay-at-home mother to the Fedora project leader in like two years flat, because that's what I did. So I encourage people to uh, get involved in open source projects if they care about them, because you might wind up working on the thing that you actually care about and love, which is an awesome situation to uh, fall into. So. Okay, well, thank you very much.